The series opens up as snippets of footage shot by Monarch agent Bill Randa document his organization's expedition to Skull Island in 1973. Monarch is a covert organization dedicated to studying massive unidentified terrestrial organisms, or MUTO, who are commonly called as Titans. The footage includes Monarch's first violent encounter with Skull Island's Titan ruler, Khan. After the brief montage, Bill turns the camera towards himself and apologizes to an unknown person for his mistakes, though he hopes his legacy will be vindicated. He is cut off by an approaching giant spider-like monster who pursues him to the edge of a small cliff, overlooking the ocean. Trapped, he withdraws a waterproof bag and throws his equipment into the sea. Before the giant spider can kill him, a huge crab monster emerges from the ground and engages the other titan in battle. Bill narrowly avoids their many thrashing limbs before they both tumble into the water. Fast forward to the Sea of Japan in 2013, and Bill's package gets caught up in a fishing net. The fisherman examines it briefly before returning to sorting his catch. The scene shifts to 2015 as Kate Randa, an American teacher, remains seated on a packed plane as officials spray a disinfectant throughout the cabin. Their containment suits prompt a flashback to being trapped on the Golden Gate Bridge while Godzilla was attacking. She finally disembarks and notices the Godzilla evacuation route signs painted on the pathway, with large yellow arrows showing the way. Kate is visiting Tokyo to investigate a set of keys that belong to her presumed dead father, Hiroshi Randa. As the taxi drives her to her father's apartment, she spots signs indicating what to do if Godzilla returns. Giant missile launchers also signal the city's preparedness for an eventual attack. Her mom calls just as she approaches the apartment, but neither woman has any idea why he is keeping a place in Tokyo. Once she opens the door, Kate is stunned when the apartment is filled with photos of her father with another woman and child. When the people in the photos see her in the apartment, they assume she simply broke into their home. But Kate shows them the keys she found on her father's desk, and only then do they all realize the deceased man had two families. However, the son, Kintaro, is skeptical that the woman is who she says she is. Kate shows them family photos to prove they have the same dad. She also reveals he was rarely home on weekends, even though her parents were married for 30 years. Not wanting to cause a scene, she leaves her dad's keys behind and takes off. As she's leaving the apartment, Kate's mom calls again, but they're suddenly disconnected when the early warning system alarm sounds throughout the city. People race toward safety in shelters specifically designated for such an attack. After a while, Kintaro and Amiko catch up with Kate in the street and escort her to the shelter. They need to remain in place until the all-clear alert sounds, and Kintaro and his mom use this opportunity to ask if Hiroshi was with her in San Francisco when Godzilla attacked. Kate confirms he wasn't with her as a flashback shows what happened on the school bus on the day of the attack. She tried to keep the students calm but fell out of the back of the bus while leading the way out. When she made it to her feet, she was face to face with Godzilla. Still, she continued evacuating the bus until it plunged off the bridge. Unfortunately, some of the students were trapped inside and didn't survive. Shortly afterwards, the all clear signal sounds and everyone makes their way out of the shelter. Kintaro doesn't want anything to do with Kate, but his mom wants her to join them at home for tea. Kate has no desire to spend time with her father's other family, but Kintaro points out she came all this way and didn't accomplish anything. Eventually, Kate reconsiders and accompanies Kintaro to their dad's office. She's unimpressed but looks around while questioning whether either of them ever really knew what their father did for a living. Surprisingly, neither ever met anyone he worked with. Upset at her dad, Kate rips his work off the wall, accidentally exposing a safe. She tries a few passcodes before discovering he used a combination of their birthdays. Inside the safe is the monarch bag Bill Randa tossed into the ocean all those years ago. She recognizes the monarch symbol as it was on the men's uniforms on the Golden Gate Bridge. Following this, the half-siblings meet with Kintero's ex, Mei, who happens to be a highly talented hacker. She's upset he ghosted her and is now treating her like tech support. Still, she gives in just to help Kintero determine if Kate's really his sister. Back at May's place, she notes the file is encrypted but manages to work around it. Files designated as top secret open, triggering an alert at Monarch headquarters. A Monarch data expert quickly informs her boss of this development and explains that whoever opened it up quickly took it offline once they determined the software worked. All the official can say is that the file was accessed in Tokyo. Her boss, Tim, sends her away, promising he'll take care of it. Meanwhile, Mei, Kintero, and Kate have no idea what they're looking at as hundreds of files pop up on the screen. Kate spots a photo of Bigfoot, 
and Kintera spots a big satellite map that looks like the one Kate ripped off their dad's office wall. However, Kate reveals people from Monarch were in San Francisco during the attack, and they were taking pictures while Godzilla wreaked havoc on the Golden Gate Bridge. Since the map was in their dad's office, she thinks he must be part of Monarch. But Kintero doesn't believe their dad would be involved in something like this. Next, another brief flashback of San Francisco in 2014 shows Kate calling her dad from the temporary camp set up for those who've been rescued. He quickly joins her and hugs her but then explains he can't flee with her and her mom. He's got passes for them to go to one of his friend's house and asks Kate to take care of her mother since he can't go with them. A week later, Kate learns that the plane her father was in had disappeared somewhere in Alaska and the wreckage was never found. In the present, Kintero doesn't think their dad is a monster and the answers must be in these files. Suddenly, Kate's attention is drawn to a photo of her grandmother, Keiko, standing in a massive footprint. Kintero also recognizes Keiko, but never met her since she died when their dad was little. The scene then shifts to Kazakhstan in 1959, where cryptozoologist Bill Randa, soldier Lee Shaw, and scientist Dr. Keiko Mira check the radiation levels as they drive out to nowhere. Their good-natured banter suggests they've been friends for a while, and Bill and Keiko are married with a kid. They arrive at their target location, and Bill reveals that their task is to confirm whether or not there is a network of tunnels under the earth. At the site, they don gas masks before slipping into a restricted area. They don't make it far before encountering a boy with a rifle who holds them at gunpoint. Keiko takes off her mask to calm the teen, and she convinces him to lower his weapon. She then explains that they are scientists investigating the contamination, and the boy insists that's a fairy tale. The truth is that the government previously burned a hole through the earth all the way to unknown depths. The closer they reach the hole, the more they encounter dead trees. They stop on the edge of a small cliff, and in the near distance are industrial buildings that look deserted. Surprisingly, Keiko's Jiger counter indicates no radiation, even though they detected it miles away. She thinks there's something to the boy's story since the area isn't cordoned off due to a radiation leak. So, they walk through the industrial complex, occasionally seeing a spike on the Jiger counter. However, the spike quickly fades away, which makes Lee believe that some mysterious creatures are eating the spiked radiation. They plant charges around the facility, and watch as the sonar picks up chambers deep within the rock. This is precisely what they've been looking for, but their celebration is short-lived as the ground opens all around them. The trio then descend a staircase and discover hundreds of massive unidentified terrestrial organisms, or MUTO eggs scattered on the floor. Bill believes it's a nursery, and Lee speculates the animal who laid the eggs must be nearby. Despite the possibility of an angry mother hanging out in the chambers, Bill wants to collect samples. As Lee and Bill argue over descending deeper into the chamber, Keiko takes matters into her own hands and climbs over the railing. Keiko's attached to a rope and Bill reluctantly agrees it's the only way to get the creature's DNA samples. However, Lee thinks they're both crazy and only settles when she claims it will only take five minutes. Bill remains on a catwalk above as Lee and Keiko reach the embryos. Suddenly, the ground cracks again and Keiko is forced to hurry. They can see the creatures inside the eggs, and she believes they're insectoids since they have multiple appendages. In the meantime, the ground continues to rumble, and there's no time to finish withdrawing the DNA. As the eggs crack open, Lee and Keiko start to climb the ropes back to safety, but the creatures, called Endos Warmers, grab Keiko's legs. The sheer weight on the rope makes it impossible for Bill to keep his grip. Eventually, it slips out of his hands, causing Keiko to tumble back to the floor. The scene then shifts to 1952, where LT, Lee Shaw is in big trouble in Manila after getting into a fist fight with his fellow soldiers. Lee claims he didn't start the fight, but it doesn't matter. As a punishment, General Puckett informs him of a new assignment, observing and protecting a Japanese scientist. It is a dangerous mission, a man has already been lost, and Puckett warns Lee to take his new assignment seriously. When Lee arrives in Mindanao docks in the Philippines, he cannot wrap his head around the fact that the scientist he's charged with protecting is a woman, Dr. Keiko. He's shocked to hear that she is researching the mysterious appearance of radioactive isotopes that have been traced back to the Philippines. The trail leading to the source diminishes daily, and Keiko must hurry before it completely disappears. Soon, they stop to do some atmospheric readings when something rustles in the nearby woods. Bill Randa stumbles out of the bushes and is shocked to discover he's not alone in the area. Without hesitation, Lee places a gun to the back of his head, and Bill blurts out that he's an American Navy veteran. When Lee questions why Bill's filming the area, the latter explains he's a cryptozoologist. As the tensions shimmer, Bill suggests they need to pay attention to the local folklore about a dragon that traced a path of fire across the sky, which might have been a path of radiation. Since Lee doesn't want Bill to hang around, Keiko relieves Lee of his duty. The soldier drives off alone, 
taking the jeep, but promises to send someone to take over his assignment. Later, Bill describes the creatures he's hunting as massive unidentified terrestrial organisms, taking credit for that name. He shows Keiko his journal with a chart showing how the skylights have made the same path for centuries, like migrating birds. However, Keiko has her chart to show off. The tracks of the surveillance aircraft match perfectly with Bill's and UTO's movement. They follow the map and are stunned to find a battleship, a Slotin, in the middle of a meadow. Bill explains the ship went down 200 miles from Pearl Harbor in 1943 and is supposed to be 5,000 miles from Tokyo underwater. He films as they explore inside the wreckage but stops when he discovers his old trunk is still in good shape and still contains all the possessions he brought on board. When Keiko finally realizes Bill was on this ship, it confirms a MUTO attacked the ship and he was the only survivor. Meanwhile, the Jiger counter reacts to a reading and Lee makes a U-turn heading back to Bill and Keiko. On the other hand, the ship's walls and his shipmate's dead bodies are covered with a slimy organic substance. They decide it's time to beat a hasty retreat, but their passage is now full of fresh, dripping slime that wasn't there before. Bill leads the way toward a different exit as the ship shakes, parts come crashing down, and a creature launches an attack. Just then, Lee returns carrying a flare and is completely confused about what's happening. But there's no time to explain as he's almost snatched up in a giant claw while trying to free Bill who's trapped under a fallen piece of the ship. Somehow, they leap out of a hole in the side of the ship and run away just as the ship falls over on its side. A massive winged titan known as an ion dragon emerges from the wreckage and swoops toward our fleeing heroes, who barely escape with their lives. In the present day, Kentaro visits his dad's office looking for more clues about his involvement in the mysterious monarch organization. Frustrated over all his father's secrets, he spends a minute trashing the place before deciding to open a locked file cabinet. Inside is a folder with the Monarch logo and a file on Lee Shaw that indicates he moved into a retirement community. It's also revealed Shaw's birth date is August 3, 1924, so in 2015 he should be 91. Furthermore, the folder also contains a reel of film from the Philippines. Later, Kate is all packed up and heading to the train station, unaware she's being followed. Her mom calls and Kate confesses that whatever her dad was working on has nothing to do with the family. Soon, the man following her catches up and makes small talk. The stranger introduces himself as Tim, who works for Monarch and wants the files returned immediately. When she says she needs to make a call, he doesn't give her a chance to flee and grabs her arm. They head out of the train station, and she calls her mom on speaker. Suddenly, she throws the phone at Tim's face, leaves her luggage behind, and makes a run for it. Unfortunately, Tim's got back up, and she's shoved into a car. Inside the car, Tim places a hood over her face and swears they won't hurt her. Kate panics and experiences a flashback of Godzilla and the Golden Gate Bridge. She kicks the driver, Duval, in the head, causing her to lose control of the car and sending it crashing into a barricade. Kate then makes her way out and runs off before her abductors can follow. She manages to make it to a police station and gives a report of the assault. Unfortunately, she doesn't have any ID because it was in the bag that she left behind. Everything's gone, including her passport and money. However, the cop doesn't believe her story and suggests she pay a visit to the American Embassy. He makes a call while she's still at the desk, and Kate takes off. On the other hand, Quintero heads over to May's place, and after an uncomfortable moment of discussing their relationship, he asks for the old computer files. She doesn't turn them over and instead sends him away. After slamming the door in his face, she gets back to work, making a backup of the Monarch files. That night, Kate finds her way back to May's only to discover May hiding outside while Tim and Duval search her apartment. Meanwhile, Quintero receives an urgent text from May, but Tim knocks on the door before he can call her back. Quintero's mom, Emiko, grabs a photo of Leah's Tim and Duval force their way inside the apartment, demanding the stolen Monarch files. The son refuses to turn them over, and Amiko secretly slips the photo of Lee into his hand before sending him out of the room to retrieve what he stole. In the meantime, Amiko prevents Tim from following Kentaro and keeps them distracted with an offer of tea. She keeps up a steady stream of conversation to distract them, but Tim spots photos of Hiroshi on the wall and finally realizes her connection to Monarch. Suddenly, Amiko screams at Kentaro to run as Tim and Duval give chase. Fortunately, he had a head start and gets away but leaves the empty monarch bag behind. On the other hand, May and Kate retrieve May's go bag, which contains extra passports and cash. Quintero catches up with them and fills them in on Tim, which leads to an argument over what to do next. 
He ends the debate by claiming he knows where they need to head. Later, Kintero, Mei, and Kate show up at the retirement community, and thankfully, Lee Shaw is still alive. The old soldier is happy to reunite with Hiroshi's son and shocked to learn Hiroshi also has a daughter. Lee then suggests they step outside, away from the surveillance cameras, to talk. Outside, the trio tell Lee they found about the monsters through the crazy files in Hiroshi's safe. They want to know what happened to Hiroshi, and because he was so secretive, they have no idea what he was up to when he disappeared. In the meantime, Mei has been examining the garden as they talk and finds a hidden camera tucked into a tree. Lee reveals he's wearing an ankle bracelet that tracks him, and Monarch refers to the facility as secure asset management. He's being kept prisoner, and now that Monarch's onto them, they'll be after the trio, too. He then suggests they make a break for it, and cuts off his tracker, giving them a minute head start before security figures out what they're up to. The four fugitives run for the van, and Lee's confused when the van doesn't need a key to start. Still, he's the designated driver since he's got experience fighting his way out of trouble. In a flashback to an airplane hangar, Dr. Keiko Mira and Bill Randa aren't as convinced as Lee that they need to bring the military into their recently formed monarch operation investigating MUTOs. But Lee reminds them the government has money and materials they desperately need. Soon afterwards, General Puckett and his men arrive, and he can't believe Lee's really embraced what started out as just a babysitting assignment. The hangar contains a giant impression of a creature's foot that they took in Indonesia three weeks earlier. Puckett's impressed, but this is just a footprint. However, Lee and Bill suggest there's a way to lure the creature into the open, but it will require 150 pounds of uranium. However, Puckett isn't buying it because the military needs all its uranium for national defense. Only when Lee points out that this massive creature is a threat to global security does the general agree to their demand. Back in the present day, Lee is convinced that if they figure out what's in the files, they can beat Monarch to find Hiroshi. Mei confesses she already digitized the files, so they don't need to risk being caught by returning to her apartment. Lee then asks her to search for anything mentioning Alaska, and confirms Monarch was founded in the late 1940s. Once an organization built on hopes, dreams, and ambitions, Monarch have now lost their way. Lee can't believe that instead of chasing monsters, they're hunting Mei, Kate, and Kintero. He also breaks the news that Hiroshi worked for Monarch, and new monsters existed. Later, they get on a massive ferry en route to Korea, and Lee warns that if they run into an inquisitive border guard who discovers the Monarch files, they'll be in huge trouble. He wants to toss them overboard, but Kintero stops him. However, after a lot of insisting from the old soldier, Kintero gives in and tosses the Monarch files over the side of the ship. After several hours, they arrive in Pohang, South Korea, and Lee stumbles through an excuse as to why he doesn't have a passport. But, the border authorities do not buy into it, and they're escorted to a waiting police vehicle. It turns out one of the guards is Lee's friend, and it's all a setup to get them past the checkpoint. Meanwhile, Monarchs Tim and Duval meet with a high-ranking official who's upset to have been drawn into Tim's unauthorized operation. She orders them to return to Monarch's headquarters and cease their pursuit of Kate, Kintero, and May and the return of Bill Randa's field notes, a pursuit that led to Lee Shaw escaping Monarch's control at the retirement center. But Tim is convinced Lee's working on a way to avert another attack by a Titan. The Monarch official doesn't care, but when news arrives that Shaw's in South Korea, she changes her mind and orders Duval to get on it with help from a tactical team. In response, Duval requests that Tim be allowed to join her, and the official reluctantly agrees. In the meantime, Lee's friends take him and the others to a plane that looks incapable of lifting off the ground, insisting it'll make it to Alaska just fine. The old man fills in missing pieces in Hiroshi's history, explaining by the time that Hiroshi became involved, Monarch was more about boring paperwork than monster hunting. On the other hand, May discovers geo-coordinates in Bill's handwriting in the files. The notes and Kate's memory of where Hiroshi was heading help Lee to pinpoint Hiroshi's probable location. They come to the conclusion that he was headed toward Barrow, Alaska but that isn't where he was going. Suddenly, the plane's instruments start going crazy and Lee takes over as pilot positive they're about to find whatever Hiroshi was after. They head straight down and then level out at the last minute, where Lee spots a place to land in the snow, and puts it down, without crashing. Next, they get out and walk a short way before they come across a plane crash. Parts are strewn around the area of impact, but the dead pilot still strapped into the cockpit isn't Hiroshi. Meanwhile, the other seatbelt is unbuckled, and Lee thinks maybe Hiroshi was thrown free. A campsite is set up nearby, and inside are supplies, cameras, maps, and equipment to record readings. Kate and Kintero recognize their dad's handwriting, and the pencil shavings he'd always leave wherever he was working. Relieved, they hug when they realize their dad survived. 
Elsewhere, the pilot finds a rope that snagged the landing gear and figures out Hiroshi's plane didn't crash. He does a bit more looking around and finds huge claw marks in the plane's hull. He then runs toward his plane and screams for Lee, Mei, Kate, and Kentaro to join him. Just as the pilot starts the engine, a giant frost titan emerges from under the snow and stops the plane. It sucks all the heat and energy from both the pilot and the aeroplane, and the pilot dies frozen stiff behind the wheel. The creature then turns toward the other four humans. The scene then shifts to Bikini Atoll 1954, where Lee, Keiko, and Bill arrive and witness the military's setup of a huge bomb. Lee speaks with General Puckett and explains they didn't ask for a uranium bomb. However, the general says that he was ordered to destroy the creature if they managed to draw it out of hiding. Lee knows that the military will pull its funding if the creature fails to show up. Keiko's okay with that, she's upset they just want to blow it up rather than study it. Soon, a camera rolls as suddenly sonar reading Spike, indicating there's something out there. Godzilla appears in the water, moving at incredible speed toward the island. Concerned, Lee tries one more time to convince General Puckett to stand down, but he refuses. Within a few minutes, Godzilla rises out of the ocean, lets out a mighty roar, and heads toward where the uranium bomb has been set up. A countdown begins as it approaches, and Lee is forced to chase after Keiko as she attempts to stop the signal from reaching the bomb. But the bomb ignites, and the massive explosion appears to have done its job. Later, Keiko is still upset, and Bill attempts to comfort her while Lee reveals his latest conversation with Puckett. The soldiers submitted their proposal of multiple monarch monitoring stations, and more staff, and Puckett rejected it because they didn't ask for enough. It turns out Monarch will get a blank check to find more MUTOs. However, they'll have to keep all of this top secret. Keiko wonders if they can keep the next discovery secret from General Puckett, but Lee doesn't want to get court-martialed, so he suggests the scientist duo not to tell him everything. The scene shifts to a woman sunbathing in the middle of nowhere as the wind kicks up and some sort of equipment inside her camper begins beeping. It's Utah in 2015 and the woman's name is Barnes. She's monitoring Outpost 47 and did not expect an old, dusty piece of equipment to spring back to life. Barnes is part of Monarch and demands to speak to Assistant Director Verjugo. Once connected to the big boss, she reports seeing radiation, specifically gamma rays, similar to supermassive black holes in outer space. The old piece of equipment seems to indicate the source is in Alaska. When Verjuga is about to cut off the video call, Barnes warns that the last time there were readings like this was right before Godzilla attacked San Francisco. At that exact moment, Lee Shaw, Kate Randa, Kintaro Randa, and May are under attack by the giant frost titan. Everyone except Kintaro makes a break for it as he lags behind the group, shooting a flare over the creature's head in an attempt to distract it. The ploy briefly works, and Kintaro chases after his friends. The four humans make it into a cave and remain quiet until the creature moves away. After the titan has gone away, the four of them walk along through the snow. May's walking way too fast, concerned she's about to lose her toes to frostbite. Both Lee and Kintaro want her to slow down since they have no idea where they're going. However, they do have to keep moving since the frost titan is still on the prowl. After a while, Kintaro reveals he saw a golf ball-like structure from the plane and they should head toward it. He is the only one who saw it, and Lee's wary of heading to the middle of nowhere. Still, they follow Kintero's lead until it seems he was wrong about spotting a building as nothing man-made appears. Fortunately, Kate spots a tunnel of light in the sky and thinks they should head toward it instead. May believes Kintero imagined a building, but the latter insists the building was real. He's willing to go off on his own to prove it. Irritated, Lee tells him that he should go find it if he's certain, and if something's there, he can send back help. Meanwhile, they'll head toward the light. Night falls, and Kintero starts hearing voices as he slowly makes his way through a snowstorm. His water's frozen solid and stumbles and falls on his back in the snow, hallucinating that May's beside him, shining a light into the air. Similarly, May, Kate, and Lee aren't having an easy time either, and May needs Kate's help to walk. Suddenly, the trio realize they're back at Hiroshi's tent, and they've just walked in a big circle. Lee explains that Titans can change their environment, and this place is stranger than they think. Inside the tent, Kate wraps May up and has a fire going to heat them up. Lee joins them and shares the crackers and chocolate he managed to gather up. Unfortunately, he is going to have to burn Hiroshi's papers since they don't have anything else to use for kindling. He does so reluctantly, moments before the frost titan breaks the ice and heads toward their camp. Panicked, they flee the tent just in the nick of time and watch as the creature sucks up the fire as energy. Suddenly, they realize that the titan's going after heat, so it's not attacking them. Lee wants to light the aviation fuel on fire to give them time to escape. 
However, May doesn't think she's going to make it. At some point, she'll just be dead weight. She advises Kate to do what it takes to make it out alive, even if that means ditching Lee, too. On the other hand, Kentaro only manages to get to his feet because he hears his dad's voice. Hiroshi walks past him in the snow, and Kentaro begs him not to leave him alone. The young man then sees a trail of pencil shavings in the snow, and follows them over a small rise. He's mere feet from a building which he imagines is the gallery that showed his work. After he enters and tells his dad that although he sold a few pieces, Kimmy dropped him as a client. However, his dad never responds, as Kintero recalls him saying he was talented and could make a living with his art. Disheartened, he then cries as he admits he never wanted to disappoint him, even though he thought his work wasn't ready. It's revealed he never saw his dad again after that night at the gallery. Shortly after, Kintero emerges from the memory and discovers a working radio in this deserted building. Pencil shavings on the desk appear to confirm his dad was there at some point. Back at the tent, Lee's about to light a bonfire using his dead friend's body as kindling when the creature emerges from below the ice. It chases after May and Kate as Lee hurries to light a fire. Out of nowhere, a helicopter appears, and Kate frantically waves her arms to get its attention. Unfortunately, May holds the backpack with her laptop in front of her as the frost vark titan begins sucking her heat. Simultaneously, Lee is sent flying through the air as the rocket fuel bonfire explodes. The creature turns its attention from May to the fire as Kate helps her run toward the helicopter. In the meantime, Lee struggles to his feet and races toward the chopper. They're surprised to discover Kintero's already safely inside it. Back at Monarch's headquarters, Verjugo delivers the news that there have been noteworthy radiation readings. Another scientist, Dr. Barnes joins by video and shares the readings, which match the gamma ray flare that occurred before the Godzilla attack in San Francisco. Meanwhile, Tim insists that Bill Randa's files contain something important that they need to combat whatever's happening. In the final scene, Kate thanks Kintero for rescuing them. He explains he found pencil shavings and realized their dad was there and fixed the radio. In the meantime, Lee opens May's backpack and discovers her laptop is frozen solid. The helicopter lands and Tim's there to greet them. Tim tells the pilot, Shaw, it's an honor to finally meet him while Kate stares at the man who attempted to kidnap her in Tokyo. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notification, and leave 1000 likes or 100 comments if you'd like us to continue part 2. Thank you.